If you would turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah 43 and verse 26. In the Word of God, we learn how to pray. We have the success formula in the Word of God. God's Word is the instruction manual. And I know there's a stereotype about guys not wanting to follow instructions. I think that's probably true of people in general. But we've all done it, whether it's putting together a Christmas gift or uh, fixing something around the house. You know, I like to joke with Jessica that when I have it in my head that I'm going to do something, I end up having to call someone to fix what I did. And better to call an expert in the first place and save the time and the frustration plus the expense of having them fix it the way it should have been done in the first place. Amen? But we've all done that where we've tried to do something without following the instructions. You tried to put something together without following the instructions and there were pieces left over. There were screws left over, whatever it is. And people do the same thing in prayer. They want to do it their way. They want to follow their rules. They want, they, they're hoping that it should work the way they want it to work. But that just leads to frustration. So we have the instruction manual. We just have to follow it. And so in God's Word, we learn how to pray. And in our lives, we ought to trust God. We ought to trust Him in every area of life, and we ought to trust His Word. And we ought to trust His Word in what it says for every area of life. You know, Sunday when we dealt with Solomon and dealt with wisdom, but we also dealt with marriage and family and being equally yoked together and choices and this thing of whether or not someone chooses to marry someone who is an unbeliever or someone chooses to marry someone who is lukewarm or someone chooses to marry someone who they say they're a Christian but they're not of like mind and like faith. Somebody might say, well, I don't agree with that and I think this and I think that. But when we head down those roads, we do that to our own detriment. God wants us to walk in His blessing in every area of life. And so instead of doing our own thing, we ought to simply trust our Heavenly Father. And we ought to trust His Word, and we ought to trust the instructions He's given us in every area of life, including in prayer. And prayer is a key part of God's plan for our lives. Prayer should be a part of our everyday lives. Prayer should not just be something we do when there's a need, or there's an emergency, or in an area of life, we've headed down this road of doing it our way, and now we're messed up, we're, we're jammed up, there's an emergency, and then we pull the ripcord, we dial 911, we call on the Lord for help. That, that prayer should be so much more in our lives, and it ought to be a part of our everyday lives. Our Heavenly Father encourages us to remind Him of His Word when we pray, to remind Him of what He has said in His Word when we pray. And that, again, is not something that we should only do when we're in need or there's an emergency. That's something that we ought to do every day of our lives. And if you have a mature prayer life, and if you have matured in prayer, there ought to be certain verses that you recite on a daily basis. There ought to be certain passages that you pray on a daily basis. You know, in the Psalms, for instance, Psalm 1, Psalm 23, Psalm 91, Psalm 103, there ought to be certain key things where you're constantly rehearsing it, reciting it to the Lord, constantly confessing it. It ought to be a part of your everyday life. Isaiah 43 and verse 26, I'm going to read it out of the King James. It says, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare that. Declare it, say it, that thou mayest be justified. And remember, as we've learned in the Holy Week Revival sessions on prayer, in your life for whatever the need is, whatever the prayer request is, whatever's going on, whatever you're praying about, find two or three scriptures that cover your need or cover your situation, whatever it is. Find two or three scriptures that cover your need and cover your situation. And I know people want to email, people want to Facebook, but this is what Google is for. 
Bible verses about X, Y, or Z. And of course, we've got great resources and helps. Pastor's Book of Prayer is great. If you go through the confession booklet, the 10 things we must confess or the daily prayer confession booklet, it's full of verses. That'll help you get started. But if there are particular areas of your life and you're looking for those two or three scriptures, you might have to dig into the Word of God. You might have to open the concordance at the back by the maps. You might have to get a date Bible from the cafe or, or have that added to your software and get into the Word of God and find the Word that covers your need or covers your situation. If you find it on your own, it'll stick with you better. Then if you message Aaron or you message me and you're asking for the cheat sheet, and I'm fine with giving people the cheat sheet, but it's far more effective to do your own homework. Amen? So whatever the need is, whatever you're praying about, whatever the situation is, find two or three scriptures that cover your need or your situation. Get those deposited down in your heart. Memorize them. And when I was a student at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, I was privileged to take evangelism with Roy Fish. And at that point, he was basically semi-retired, only taught one or two classes a year. Great man of God, great evangelist. But the thing he talked about as much as evangelism is memorizing the Word of God. And he, everywhere he went, he always carried a stack of little note cards with him, and he was constantly working on memorizing the Word of God, depositing the Word of God into his heart so that he, he could speak it and say it, whether in witnessing to someone, praying to the Lord, ministering to someone, counseling someone, whatever it was. And that, that stuck with me. He probably talked about that in every class, every time we were together, getting the Word of God down into your heart, memorizing it. So you can pray it, so you can speak it, so you can declare it. You know, think about, think about Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who is our ultimate example. When his parents couldn't find him when he was a young, young man, he, he was at the temple asking the religious leaders questions about the scriptures. Well, how did he know to ask those questions? Well, he had been studying the scriptures. He knew his father's word. When Satan showed up and tempted him, he knew his father's word and he, he spoke his father's word in response to Satan. So find those scriptures, whatever the needs are in your life, begin to memorize them, get them down into your heart, then put God in remembrance of his word and do that daily. Now in the first message when Pastor began this series a few weeks ago, he mentioned that more important than the length of time that you pray is being consistent in your prayer life. And a lot of times we can get a certain thing in our minds and get under guilt and condemnation. During the day sessions on prayer a few weeks ago, during the Holy Week revival, I mentioned honestly how as ministers, we always feel the pressure to spend more time in the Word, to pray more, to do more. But it's wrong of me to take that burden and put it on you, the sheep, the people of God. And so what we always say is, develop a consistent prayer life. Get started and then be consistent. And to be consistent, you might have to start with 10 minutes a day. But how can you do 20 minutes a day if you can't do 10 minutes a day? How can you do 30 minutes a day if you can't do 20 minutes a day? So you've gotta get started, you've gotta be consistent, I like praying in the morning and starting the day off having prayed up full of faith and having settled all heavenly business first thing in the morning. And David, of course, spoke about that in the Psalms, in his writings, praying early in the morning before the day has begun. I know, though, there are people that work at night and have different schedules, so the key is to set apart a time to spend in the Word of God and in prayer to get started and be consistent. And then in that prayer time, to have verses that you are putting God in remembrance of. Well, how long do I need to do that for? Until you go to be with the Lord in heaven. It's human nature. You know, when we had for a period of time Friday night prayer, 
pastor noticed that when someone had a major need in their life, they would come. They would come for a few weeks, they would be here, but as soon as that prayer request was met, then they would be gone and wouldn't be at Friday night prayer anymore. And that's not to be critical, this is simply what we do as human beings. It is human nature. There is a need, there is an emergency, so we get serious, we buckle the seatbelt, we, we ramp down, we spend more time in the Word and prayer, we get the situation resolved, we're happy, we have a testimony, and then we go back to default. Well, we need to change what the default is and spend more time in the Word, more time in prayer. As we learned during the Holy Week revival, when you pray, ask once, then from that point forward, believe you receive. And this is why having those verses and having those verses in your prayer time is great because this is one way you can believe you receive, and that's by simply reciting and declaring what the Word of God says, simply putting our Heavenly Father in remembrance of His Word. You know, with finances, and a great example is Philippians 4.19. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are supplying all of my needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You know, that's a great verse to pray and to recite and to put our Heavenly Father in remembrance of every single day. Not just when you have a need. Not just when there's an unexpected bill. But every day of your life. And so one way you can believe you receive is by daily, say daily, confessing the promises and the scriptures that you're standing upon. And so that's why you come to 5 a.m. prayer, you'll see men, and uh, whether it's old-fashioned on a piece of paper, handwritten, I see a lot of men walking around and they got their iPhone or whatever device they have, and they, they built a confession list, they built a prayer list, and if, if they've done it right, they're going to have scripture verses and references to go with those prayer points. And what are they doing? Well, they're, they're modeling what pastor has modeled for all of us, which is what works. It's the pattern that works. It is the process that works. Isaiah 43, 26, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. When I read that, I think of Jacob wrestling with the Lord. I think of Jacob not letting go until he got his blessing. It's a daily thing. It's a life lived. And that is what has great power with God. Not, not just approaching our Heavenly Father occasionally, but having a real relationship with Him and a relationship with Him in our prayer life. And that's why, of course, prayer is not just us talking, but it's also us listening. Listening to what he would tell us to do, to change, to improve, to tweak, what to repent of, what to get out of our life, what to do, how to be a blessing, whatever it is. Not just us talking, but us listening. So through Isaiah, God himself has told us to put him in remembrance of his word. Now, if God did not want us to put him in remembrance of his word, why would he have Isaiah tell us that? To put him in remembrance of his word. This is God's plan, and this is God's process for a successful prayer life. To, to put him in remembrance of his word. And we can do all sorts of things, all sorts of things that make us feel good. We can do all sorts of things that make us feel spiritual, but it doesn't mean that they work. It doesn't mean that they have any power. It doesn't mean that they get any results. We did the short series a few years ago. Could you not tarry one hour? We talked about the various types of prayer. The prayer of consecration is one type of prayer. Lord, if it be your will. But, but that's not how you pray in every prayer. Well, Lord, I'll be faithful and I won't leave my family if it's your will. It's the will of the Lord that you be faithful. <laughs> Stop talking like... An idiot. But people, people pray and talk this way, and it sounds real spiritual. I mean, you can, you can do that and then pray in the King James to, to feel even more spiritual, but it doesn't get results. It doesn't have any power. 
And if I'm going to spend time in prayer, I want to do what works. If I'm going to get up early in the morning and do my best to beat Samuel waking up in the morning, you know, and walk around the, the house with a cup of coffee, I, I don't want to be wasting my time. I want to be spending my time effectively doing kingdom business on behalf of our family, the church, the people of God praying on your behalf. I don't want it to be wasted time. When we neglect God's plan and this divine process of faith to put our Heavenly Father in remembrance of His Word, when we neglect to do that, we, we do that to our own detriment. What is the divine process of faith? Well, it's in Romans 10, 9 and 10. To believe in your heart, to confess with your mouth. To believe in your heart, to confess with your mouth until you receive whatever it is you're believing God for. And that works for salvation, but that works for any good thing from our Heavenly Father. Isaiah 43, verse 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou, that thou mayest be justified. Jeremiah 1 and verse 12, and the King James says, Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. So what does God perform? His word. What does God bring to pass in our lives? His word. So if we ask our Heavenly Father to do something contrary to His word, is He going to bring that to pass in our lives? If we want to see God move on our behalf, we have to ask Him according to His Word. He hastens to perform what? His Word. So that's why we got to find out what His Word says, put Him in remembrance of His Word, stand in faith on His Word, and it's His Word that He is going to perform and to bring to pass in our lives. And that's what has power, reciting our verses for the King. That's what has power, putting him in remembrance of his word. Our words have no power. What has power is God's words coming out of our mouth. That's what has power to change your life, to change your circumstances, and to move the mountain out of the way, whatever it is. Jeremiah 1.12 in the Amplified Bible says, Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am actively watching over my word to fulfill it. I am actively watching over my word to fulfill it, to perform it, to fulfill it, to bring it to pass in your life. Now, as we've learned, there's lag time between seed time and harvest. But be encouraged by this verse, by Jeremiah 1 and verse 12, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Hasten means to do something quickly, to move hurriedly. It means for something to happen sooner than it would otherwise. And that, that encourages me, for something to happen sooner than it would otherwise. You know, sometimes it can seem like there, there's a long time until the harvest comes. My father's not told this story too often, but he's told it over the years about how one time he took me, I, I might have been in high school or college, but he took me to a bank where he had a safe deposit box. He wanted me to see that safe deposit box. He wanted me to know how to access it. He wanted me to see what was inside of it. But when we did that, he, he got out a stack of index cards where he had written on them every prayer request and every goal. And he flipped through them to illustrate for me that over the years, every single item, every single prayer request, every single goal had come to pass. Now in real time, it doesn't seem like everything's coming to pass quickly. But when you look at things in the rearview mirror, it's amazing how quickly our Heavenly Father moves on our behalf. He hastens His Word to perform it in our lives. And that hasten means to do something quickly, quickly excuse me, hurriedly. It means for something to happen sooner. Say, say sooner, sooner than it would otherwise. For I will hasten my word to perform it. So our Heavenly Father, He is watching over His word to perform it and to bring it to pass in our lives. So when you speak and confess and rehearse His word, 
and His promises, our Heavenly Father will cause His Word to come to pass in your life. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 14 says, but the Word is very near you. I want to add in the, the word should. The word should be near you. The word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart. Why? That you may do it. And this is where the rubber hits the road. And this is the difference between living an average life and a life blessed by God. This is the difference between unanswered prayer and answered prayer. This is the difference between, go to Malachi 3.18, you will again see the distinction. This is the reason there's a distinction. And there is a distinction in the body of Christ. The word is near you in your mouth. It's in your mouth and in your heart that you may. Now I'm not talking about here at FCC, but just in general, in America, in the body of Christ in America. To what percentage is the word of God in the mouth of every Christian. To what percentage is the Word of God in the heart of every believer? Then, to what percentage is every believer actively taking action on the Word of God? To what percentage is every believer actively a doer of the Word of God? This is, this is where it's at. This is where it's at, right here. That you may do it. Romans 10 and verse 8 Paul quotes this, but what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. And what, what is the purpose of this word? That we may do it. That we may have it. That we may do it. That we may live it out. That it may be a reality in our lives. And this is why, this is why people have a problem with the blessing of God. Nobody minds someone praying. What they mind is God showing up. What they mind is the prayer being answered. What they mind is the answered coming. Everybody's used to unanswered prayer. What they mind is answered prayer. What they mind is the blessing of God. What they mind is the power of God. But this is, this is a total package deal. And that's why Sunday mornings, the verse, Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his. That's why if you, you want the things of God to work for you, if you want your prayer life to have power, you got to live the life. you got to walk with the Lord. And it's not uh, only do it when you're in need kind of thing. It's the life you live every day of your life, no matter what's going on. Even if you're living in 2020. You know, I love that meme from Back to the Future. Where it says, whatever you do, don't put it in 2020. That's great. I know the politicians feel that way. We're to live the life. And when you live the life, it has power. And when you live the life, heaven backs you up. Your miracle is in your mouth. The word is near you. Where is it? In your mouth. So no matter how you feel, what should you say? What the Word says. No matter how you feel, no matter what's going on, no matter what the circumstances look like, what should you say? What the Word of God says. But how can you say it if you don't know it? And how can you say it with meaning and with conviction, being firmly persuaded if it's not been deposited down in your heart? Out of, the overflow of, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your miracle is in your mouth. But the miracle is only in your mouth when the Word of God is in your mouth. The miracle is in your mouth, but it's only in your mouth when the Word of God is in your mouth. And too many are saying anything and everything but what the Word of God says. Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. But most people are speaking death and not life. You know, there's not an official denomination of negativity, but there are a lot of believers and they are very negative. And they're speaking negativity. And they're speaking death. So what do they have manifest in their lives? Negativity and death. So too many are saying anything and everything but what the Word of God says. So the miracle 
is in your mouth only when God's word is in your mouth. Well, how long do I have to speak or declare God's word? Well, until you get your answer. But even once you have your answer, why stop? Even once the need has been met, once the answer has come, once the miracle has taken place, why stop? This is how we ought to live all the time. This is the life we ought to live. It is the best life to recite our verses for the king, to put him in remembrance every day. So the miracle is only in your mouth when God's word is in your mouth. And the miracle is only in your mouth when you take action and act like God's word is true in your life. Deuteronomy 30, verse 14, the New King James, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. That you may do it. That you may do it. Say it this way. Say, that I may do it. Say, that I may live it out. It's near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. Why? That you may do it. That you may live it out. So don't just believe the word. Believing is the first step. And people have trouble with this. But they wouldn't have trouble with this if they would read the New Testament for themselves. I mean, it's amazing how many times in Revelation it talks about those who persevere, those who overcome until the end. It's amazing how many times in the Gospels and in the Epistles and in Revelation it talks about us being judged according to what we do. So is believing important? Yes. But is it the end? No. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it, that you may live it out. Remember Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, brought into right standing with God. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And that's the process of faith, to believe in your heart, to confess with your mouth. And we start, we begin with salvation, but it's the process of faith for any good thing from God, to believe in your heart, to confess with your mouth. Well, Austin, how long do I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth? Till you receive whatever it is you're believing for. And so, tomorrow's Thursday morning, doesn't matter what's going on. Doesn't matter what the forecast is trying to decide if the media is more wrong about the weather or more wrong about this other stuff. It's a, it's a close competition. Doesn't matter if it's rainy, if it's sunny. Doesn't matter if you live in Dallas, Fort Worth, or in Seattle. You ought to wake up every day of your life and believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. That, that's the life we're to live as the children of God. Believe his word. Then confess the promises of his word with your mouth. Speak it. Declare it. You've heard my father tell the story, teasing my mom about reading, reading the, the prayer confession booklet to herself. Well, you could read it, but also pray it. Amen? But sometimes he'll say to me, Austin, I don't understand coming to prayer and not praying. The men are like, ouch. We're going to be up at 5 a.m. in the morning, amen? Let's pray. It's not conversation time. It's not hangout time. It's time to do what? To pray, to talk to our Heavenly Father, to, to listen. It's time to pray. So you've got to confess with your mouth verbally, amen? Now you don't have to shout. God's not deaf. You don't have to scream. You know, it's amazing how many things people do because they saw it on YouTube somewhere, but it's not in the Word of God. You can, you can just speak like you would speak to your husband or wife, which should be nicely, amen? <laughs> Conversationally. I guess I have to qualify that. And our Heavenly Father, He hears us. He answers us. I, I love what the Bible says about Enoch, that he, he walked with God. And then he was no more, for God took him. No Bible. No new covenant. 
No indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and yet he, he walked with God. As a fallen man, well, we're born again. We're brought into right standing with God. We're the sons and daughters of God under the new covenant. So, so what's limiting us? What is holding us back? So belief, confess out loud with your mouth and take action. And if you'll do that, you'll receive your miracle. Believe, confess with your mouth out loud and take action. And if you'll do that, you will receive your miracle. And this is the divine process of faith. Job 22 and verse 28 says, Thou shalt also decree a thing, or declare it. Thou shalt also decree a thing, or declare it, and it shall be established unto thee. We could say it'll become a reality in your life, and the light shall shine upon thy ways, upon your ways. So find the scriptures, find the promises that cover your need, whatever you're believing for, memorize them, get them down into your heart, then speak them with your mouth, confess them, pray them. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. And as we learn, as pastor taught the evening sessions, the Holy Week revival, believe you receive, keep doing this until you receive your answer. But I, I, I'm, we're confessing the word of God all the time, even when every item on the list is checked. And you're saying, Austin, is every item on the list checked? No. But we're, we're confessing and declaring the, the Word of God all the time, no matter what's going on. No matter how many prayers have been answered, no matter how many goals have been met, no matter how many miracles have taken place. You've heard my father say, every day we're waking up, we're knocking on heaven's door. We're back. We're standing on your Word. We're declaring what your Word says. Heavenly Father, we are putting you in remembrance of your word. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. You can confess and be saved, but you can also confess and be delivered. You can confess and be set free. You can confess and be healed in your physical, mortal body. I love the testimonies of people being at home and just praying and thanking God for their healing or just declaring what the word of God says and being instantly healed and instantly made well. So you can confess with your mouth and be healed. You can confess with your mouth and be set free of any addiction, of any besetting sin, of anything that anyone in your family has struggled with or dealt with. You can confess and have peace. You can have the peace of God. You can have the peace of God in your life and in your home. And even at work, doesn't matter what's going on there at work, you can have the peace of God in your office or in your cubicle, amen, in whatever space they give you, you can have your peace. Confess and have wholeness in your body and in your mind and in your spirit. You can confess and have every need met with plenty left over. You can do it. But it is a daily thing. It is an active thing because faith is now. Faith is not yesterday. Praise God, I prayed yesterday. But what have I done today? Praise God, I prayed today. But what will I be doing tomorrow? See, will I be in faith tomorrow? Faith is now. So it's not something we do occasionally. It is the life we live. Your miracle is in your mouth if the word of God is in your mouth. The miracle is in your mouth when you're speaking and declaring and confessing and praying what the word of God says. And then your miracle is in your mouth when you take action and you act like the Word of God is true in your life. So believe the Word. Confess the Word. Confess the promises of the Word of God. Then take action and act like His Word is true. Believe, confess, and take action. Believe, confess, and take action. And if you'll do that, you'll receive your miracle and you'll receive one miracle, one answer to prayer, after another. I don't want to ask for a show of hands, but you know, pastors mention periodically keeping a list of answered prayer, keeping a list of miracles. You, you ought to do that and keep track. Because if you will, you'll be amazed at how much your Heavenly Father does on your behalf. And once you realize it, you'll think, I, I should do a lot more of this. <laughs> I should ask Him more often. 
I should ask him on behalf of others more often. Once it dawns on you that this works and he, he is waiting to hasten his word and to perform it on our behalf, prayer will become a great joy and a great blessing, not a burden. It'll be a blessing. It'll be a joy. So our Heavenly Father encourages us to take action on his word, to not just speak or declare or to confess these things, but to live it out. James 1 and verse 22 says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving or deluding yourself. But be ye doers of the word. James 1, 22 in the NIV says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do. Everyone say do. Amen. Do what it says. So there are believers, and they're deceived. We would say it this way, they're self-deceived. Why is that? They're not doers of the Word of God. And that is why, that is why, say that is why, that is why. they don't live a blessed life. They're doing their own thing. You know, this Sunday we come to Rehoboam. Bad decisions, bad decisions. I wonder why Rehoboam wasn't blessed. Because he was doing his own thing. It is a path of destruction. Isaiah 119 says, If ye be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good. The NIV says the best of the land. And there are believers and they're willing, but they're not obedient. They're not a doer of the word. They're not living the word of God out in their everyday life. But then you have believers and they're willing. Excuse me, you have believers, they're they're obedient, but they're not willing to walk in the blessing of God because they're worried about what someone might think. They're worried about what someone might say. They're worried about someone's opinion or whether or not they'll be offended or whatever it is. They, they want to keep God in a box, and our Heavenly Father is not. He doesn't operate in a box. He does exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or imagine. We have a joke in our family that I have never told my father no. My father called me up, texted me tonight, and said, hey, Austin, you want to do this tomorrow? Yes. Hey, Austin, you want to go over here and eat, 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 eat over here tomorrow? Yes. Hey, Austin, do you want to go on a vacation tomorrow? Yes. <laughs> hey, hey, Austin, would you like to go look at cars? Yes. 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 We have a joker. I, I don't tell him no. And I, I don't want to tell my heavenly father no. But there are a lot of believers and they feel like they're not good enough. They're not worthy enough. And even once they get past that, if their Heavenly Father does it for them or gives it to them or blesses them with it, they're worried about what somebody at work thinks or what somebody from high school thinks. So they may be obedient, but they're not. They're not willing. Well, Heavenly Father, if you could do it, but if it could only cost this amount of money, well, you're just not dialed into reality. Whatever it cost in January, it costs a lot more now in May of 2020 because of what the government has done. And our Heavenly Father does exceedingly, abundantly above whatever we can ask, think, or imagine. So when we say, I like this, He's not only going to meet that, He's going to do above and beyond that, whatever it is. So you just got to get your mind around it and not be ashamed of it, not be embarrassed by it, not be worried about what people think. They're not thinking about you anyway. I don't know how many times I've heard my mom say that. Austin, you think they're thinking about you, but they are not. We think they're thinking about us, talking about us, but they're not. They're thinking about what's going on in their life. So you've got to be obedient but you've also got to be willing to walk in the blessings of your heavenly Father. If you are willing and obedient. If you are obedient and willing. Kenneth Hagin would tell the story about how he went to the Lord about this. He even fasted three days. Lord, I've done what you've told me to do, and I, I, I'm doing what you've told me to do in the ministry, and I'm going backwards. Lord, I did what you told me to do, I did what you told me to do in the ministry and in the ministry you've given me and we're going backwards. Our needs are not met. 
and this car I've been driving, it's worn out, the tires are falling off, and we're in need, we're in debt. And that's when the, he got his answer during that fast. Think after two days. But the Lord told him, you've been obedient, but you haven't been willing. And he would laugh and say, I got will, willing like that. Because it's an attitude. It is an attitude. And we can change in a moment, and we can get willing. Any promise in the Word of God requires action. Any promise in the Word of God requires obedience. We mentioned Sunday how it's amazing how many times in the Word of God you have that word, if. The promises of God are conditional. And His promises become a reality in our lives when we become doers of the Word and take action. Deuteronomy 30, verse 14, the Word is near you in your heart and in your mouth that you may do it. That you may do it. That you may do it. That I may do it. That we may do it. James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do, say that again, say do, do what it says. Deuteronomy 30.14, that you may do it. Say, say this, say that I may do it. That I may live it out. At all times. Not just on Sundays. Not just on Wednesdays. Not just at Easter. Not just at Christmas. But all the time, every day of my life. And that's how you walk in the blessing of God. You live it out. You live the life. And prayer then becomes not an occasional thing, but an everyday thing. And you begin depositing the Word of God in your life. And as you have needs or requests or things you're concerned about in your life or the lives of others, and you find what the Word of God says, you memorize those scriptures, you memorize those promises, you, you deposit them down in your heart. Yes, you pray those scriptures and promises about those prayer requests or those needs, but once the answer comes, once the need is met, you don't stop there. Every day of your life, you keep putting him in remembrance of his word. Every day of your life, you keep reciting your verses for the king. Every day of your life, you keep believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth while you live out his word, while you're obedient, while you're a doer of the word, and what becomes a reality in your life? His word. What does God hasten to perform in the life of a believer who lives like that? His word. And that's why, as we've been saying, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world or in the news. His word is true in our lives no matter what is going on in the world no matter what is going on in the news. His word is true.